This is an introductory lecture to social psychology. We're looking here at this, uh, it's called levels of analysis. We're looking at theories. How do we develop explanations of social psychological phenomena? Things like prejudice, intergroup conflict, love and attachment, things like that. So how do we develop theories? What is the, what's the characteristic of a good theory? And that's really what we're going to be discussing in this lecture, levels of analysis. So if I had to ask you, how does a car work? So we try to develop a theory of how does it, what is a good explanation of how a car works? Well, you might say you have to, you know, open the door, get in, you know, turn on the ignition and drive. That's how a car works. And it's a good explanation. That is how a car works. But there's other explanations we could also give, alternative candidate explanations. For example, you might describe the workings of the internal combustion engine, or you might discuss the, the conversion of energy from rotary energy in the wheels to, to forward energy. All these are candidate accounts. So which one should we settle with? Which is the best? Does this help? If we took the car apart and looked at its constituted components, there they're all laid out over there. And of course that is important. For a car to work, each one of these components is critical. You need to have wheels, you need to have a transmission system, you need to have valves, you need to have pistons, and the design of each object is vital for the working of a car. But taking it to pieces doesn't really explain how the car works. What we need to do is look at how these pieces fit together into functional units, like for example, the engine of the hundreds of units come together and they work together to make the car work. And the same thing accounts for the kinds of explanations that we want to develop in, in social psychology. We need to know the components. We need to know the design of the components. But the question there, does knowing about the component parts actually tell you how the system works? No. We need to know how those components fit together. And more than that, we need to know how they work together how these components fit together to form functional units. Now that's really what we want to take away for our lesson over here about social psychology. How do humans work? Well, what are the different parts? How do the different parts fit together? And then how do they work together to produce certain kinds of outcomes that we're interested in explaining? Like for example, prejudice. So we can describe a car, the functional aspect of a car, as the parts, we need to know them, their design, and their functional relation between them. And that's what we're going to transfer here to our lecture. Okay, so to revise, this is a revision slide, so our levels of analysis here that we're talking about are the the, the, the microscopic level or the micro level, that's the, at the level of the different components, it's the local level. And then we want to see how these components fit together to make functional units. And then at a broad functional level, a system level, we want to know how they work together. And even the driver has a, a role in the working of a car as it's in its terms of its overall functional design. So how do we apply this now to social behavior and to social psychology? What is the social psychology machine? What does it consist of? Well, here's a, a conventional division made by William Dwarz, and we'll to look at his theory a little bit more in, in this lecture. The, the one component, the smallest, the micro level component is the body and the brain. And those are made up of, of functional units themselves, neurons, etc. Chemical processes happening there. There's electrical processes. There's genetics. So the body and brain at the the one level. Then of course we've got individual people, um, bounded by our skin. Uh, those individual people have different sets of personalities, skills, histories, etc. These individuals exist within groups. These groups in society are extremely important for social behavior. You can take, we think, for example, of sports teams or racial groups or genders or, or national groups and how important these can become to people. And then at the broadest level, we've got 
cultures and society. We've got ideologies, we've got history, different parts of the world have developed different tastes, different ways of, of being, different views of personhood, as we discussed in our in a previous lecture, and contrasting the African and Western view of personhood. So there at the broadest level, we've got ideological themes. And these are, according to William Dwarz in his theory, four different levels of analysis. So we can develop explanations, social psycho psychological explanations for behavior at each of these four different levels. The same as with the car, we can develop explanations of how a car works from the perspective of the driver sitting behind the wheel or the transmission engine, etc. We can start at the individual components or we can look at those functional units. So here are the four different components that we could start with. Intrapersonal, things that are happening inside the individual. Interpersonal, the interactions between individuals, individual level of analysis. The positional level, notice that the groups exist in society, but he called it a positional level because these groups are often structured hierarchically. If you think about groups, for example, there's often a struggle between groups of who's the best, who's on top, and then he called the, the broadest level of culture and society the ideological level, sets of ideas and practices that um, shape our behavior and our thinking of the members within those societies. The, the, the primary three that we're going to focus on is the individual level, the group level, and the ideological and cultural level in our uh, study. So we're looking at inter-individual processes, Person, individual processes, well, psychological level processes, personality, etc. Then we're going to be looking at the relations between groups in society. Most of our course is going to be around intergroup dynamics. And then later on, we're going to be looking at discourse, language, and how culture is produced and shapes our behavior and thinking. That's really kind of overview of what social psychology uh, tries to do the kinds of explanations that it gives. You can contrast this with the, the, the theories in psychology that you're getting in your other courses. So as we discussed in a previous lecture, contrasting the, the individual and the collective view of personhood, social psychology has been individualistic. It's treated the, 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 the subject of psychology as the individual, as a bounded unit. You remember we used the word the monad in the last lecture. Uh, the, the boundaries is the skin and the, the important psychological processes happen inside the head. We, we see things, input comes in, we, we feel things, we have experiences, it's processed in the head and then we have output. So for example, you consider the theory of prejudice. You have racist individuals. They see something over there. Their racist interpretations give it a particular meaning, and then they behave in discriminatory ways. So typically, these kinds of theories focus on things that's happening inside the individual. It's focused at an individual level of analysis. This is the traditional theories in, in psychology generally, but also in social psychology. And if you think back to your other psychology courses, you'll see mostly it's focusing on things that's happening inside the mind, the individual, the individual head. It also takes the individual apart, as it were, into its constituent components. You remember that picture of the car, all of its different parts. And this is one way in which it's done. We have uh, an emotion system, a cognition system, a language system, memory, all these different components are uh, studied as individual systems of, of functioning. So not only do psychologists generally focus on individuals, but they also then take those individual parts and then look at the operation of the memory system or the attention system or emotions, language acquisition, and a whole lot of other kinds of things around personality, for example. So we would characterize this in social psychology as, a, as reductionistic approaches. Now this word reductionism is an important way of characterizing theory, and it's a bad word. I mean, we, we, we criticize psychology for being reductionistic, for focusing on the individual and trying to explain everything from individual level of analysis. So yes, it's from the Wikipedia, 
What is reductionism? A approach to studying complex systems, like a car is a complex system, certainly human psychology is a complex system. So we try to study this, this approach by ideas, by reducing them to simpler components. You remember taking the car apart, taking the individual apart in the previous slide. So that the complex systems can always be reduced to a set of simpler components. So we can take one part of the human being, for example, personality, um, the, the experiences, childhood experiences, for example, and we can explain their depression or their racism, or whatever, from this one little part of this whole complex array of life. That's called reductionism. And in psychology, we particularly use the term reductionism for individualistic kinds of explanations for those that reduce the complexity to things that are happening inside the individual and inside their minds. Here's an example that I'm going to use to illustrate reductionism and how we can apply multiple levels of analysis to produce a much more complete theory. This is the thing that we're aspiring to in social psychology. So, why do people fall in love? We're going to first look at intrapersonal. You remember you've got four different levels. The first is intrapersonal reasons. So one set of explanations for love deal with brain chemistry. If you look at on the uh, Fisher's, Helen Fisher, Dr. Helen Fisher's YouTube videos, fascinating YouTube videos on the brain chemistry of love. The, the, the kinds of hormones that operate in the brain that are detected, that we can detect when uh, that is associated with the experience of love. Testosterone, dopamine, oxytocin, and a number of other serotonin chemicals are released. And all of a sudden, when you fall in love, basically what happens, your brain is flooded with this chemical cocktail. And it produces outcomes. Like, for example, your heart beats faster. Heart fluttering um, is associated with uh, these chemicals. Also, you might have noticed when you fall in love that it's difficult to think of anything else besides your love object. Your mind keeps on going back to that love object. It's almost like there's a kind of compulsion, obsessive compulsive thought processes going towards the person that you love. Well, that's the effect of, of these chemicals. But the question here is, does this intrapersonal level of analysis explain love? Does that explain the phenomenon of romantic love? Well, it's important, but it's just a single part of a broader and more complex phenomenon. So interpersonal reasons, here's our next slide. So why do people fall in love? Well, here's another kind of explanation. They fall in love with people that they get to know. And there's a, a, a long line of research in social psychology is called propinquity, the propinquity effect, the tendency to form friendships and romantic relationships with those you encounter often. The mere exposure effect, just being exposed to a stimulus makes it more likable. So if you want someone to love you, what must you do? Spend time with them. Go out to dinner. There's been experiments. Just having a meal with someone increases liking. So just spending, just the fact of spending time together, this interpersonal dynamic produces love. Some early studies from the 1950s in the United States, in the, in the, the, a third of married couples lived within five blocks of each other. They grew up within five blocks of each other. And so in today, uh, a lot of uh, the evidence shows that occupational propinquity, you fall in love with people that you work with. So there's, there's dynamics that's happening between individuals that are important in producing uh, romantic love. So we've looked here at things that are happening inside the brain, the chemicals. We've looked at um, processes that are happening between individuals. The next level of analysis is called the intergroup level of analysis. Now, uh, interesting statistics from the United States, once again, that only one in 12 marriages is, is between members of different groups. Almost all marriages happen within race groups. Isn't that interesting? Why? Well, you might even think of in your own family. If you brought a member of another race group into your home for dinner with your, with your family, with the prospect of getting married, as opposed to someone of the same race group, would it be identical? Or would there be concerns? Well, there are 
intergroup dynamics in romantic love. So there's often associated, that's why it's called this positional level, there's a sense within groups of which is the best group, which is worse, who can you be more familiar with, who, etc. So these processes that happen between groups in society, it's got nothing to do with us as individuals and who we fall in love with, except they affect the family dynamics, they affect our choices, our preferences, etc. So those brain chemicals that we're talking about over there, whether they're going to come into effect, also depend on historical processes and group relations in society. And this links to the fourth level of analysis, which is the ideological level of analysis. And you think of how ideologies have operated in history about that, that have governed the rules of love and sexuality. Think, for example, of polygamy as a practice versus monogamy as a practice versus serial monogamy as a practice. Yeah, there's different sets of ideological rules um, and norms about what is acceptable in forms of sexual relations and cohabitation. You might have heard of the term heterosexism, the idea that um, the rules of love happen between a man and a woman. Well, currently in the society that we're living in at the moment, there's a huge ideological contestation of exactly this phenomenon. You might have heard of LGBTQ. Actually, it's the Q at the end that is interesting. It stands for queer, anything outside the dominant narrative, questioning, figuring out our identity. So these ideological processes and dynamics are happening in our society right at this time. We're, in, we're undergoing um, a process of change. There, for example, I've got a picture of Casta Semenya um, and her wife. So we can see that this is the fourth level of analysis, the ideological level of analysis. So we've looked at four different levels altogether. Things that are happening inside the individual, the intrapersonal, intrapsychological, the interpersonal levels, who you get to, to meet and associate with, spending time with people, the group level of analysis, and the ideological level of analysis. Now the question is, which one is the best? Which one is the correct? And the answer is obviously, they all have a role to play. And this next slide over here shows that what we want to try and do in good theory is see how they work together. How does things that happen at one level affect things that happen at another? How do uh, interpersonal processes affect intrapersonal processes? How do ideological level processes, ideologies that are developing in our society and history affect the relationships between groups, for example? So a good theory keeps multiple levels in focus. We try and explain the phenomenon at multiple levels of analysis. We try and look at feedback links between these levels. How does things that happen at one level affect things that happen at another level? And here's a little demonstration that I want to, to show you. This is called, it's a type of evidence that's developed in uh, social sciences. It's called a simulation. This is developed in the 1950s by Thomas Schelling. And you can imagine each one of these little dots over here as a person of a different group. So we've got a blue group and red group people. And the, the simulation operates by rules. So these, these individuals move around the screen by these rules. They're happy if they've got at least two neighbors that are the same color as them. So they want just half their neighbors, just under half their neighbors to be the same as them. So they want a little bit of segregation, not a lot of segregation. They've got lots of neighbors that live there, but they just want two that are the same as them. Um, if they don't, have those two neighbors are going to move and look for another place. If they're happy, they'll just stay. And so basically the simulation, it, it works with these agents like sort of moving around, looking for a comfortable place. And I'll play the simulation for you now. And you'll see, there they are, they're moving. And as these agents go and look for a nice place uh, that's comfortable for them, they end up creating almost a totally segregated situation. There we are, it's the simulation's working now. 
take a look at that from the beginning. The being, they were randomly distributed. <clears throat> they wanted just a little bit of segregation. So they produce in the end a system with massive levels of segregation. They produce a world that none of them want, a totally segregated world. None of them want that. They only want a little bit of segregation each, but when they're all acting together, they're all trying to do this, they produce uh, a massively segregated world, a world that none of them want or intend. <laughs> and it shows that we can produce <clears throat> unintended, the, our motives and our behaviors at one level of analysis, at the level of the individual, can produce unintended consequences at another level of analysis, the level of society. See, here we've got individuals, look, how, look at them moving. They're shuffling around, looking for a place where they've just got two neighbors the size of the, the, the same color as them, and they're creating a world where that is totally segregated, where they've got 100% neighbors the same color as them. Of course, in human societies, this is just a simulation, in human societies, when that starts happening, now all of a sudden we, um, we're living in fully segregated worlds, we, it breeds suspicion, prejudice, <clears throat> anxiety, etc., which changes the rules. Now we want more neighbors the same as us. So there's, there's feedback happening both ways. So these, the social psychological systems that we're studying are complex systems. Cars are complex systems, but human beings are much more complex systems.